Chapter 21 Boris, God of War. Set those down, put this on, Torn Bart. Ben Gast has torn through him a blackened chainmail overcoat. But these belong to Don. He's dead. You aren't yet, Torn growled. Milo! Yes, sir! Torn tossed from another chainmail tunic and then grabbed Nora's black winged helmet. Milo gaped. But she isn't. Nora is not here. If you survive, she can kill you later, Torn insisted. Are we flying too? Ben asked. Torn grinned as he threw on his own custom dark blue brigadine vest and fastened on his helmet. Sort of, yeah, he chuckled as he set down his polished black goggles over his eyes and picked up the ballista and tripod stand. Follow me, he instructed. Won't all this armor and gear weigh us down? Milo asked worriedly. Torn's barrel-chested guttural laugh resonated through the stone walls as they made their way into the stables. Maybe, but I believe in second chances. Now run and get me my war saddle. Milo and Ben set their bundles of arrows down and ran over to get the supplies while Torrin greeted his dragon. Hello, Luna, he called. A dark bronze female dragon named Luna let out an excited chirping noise. She poked her thorny crowned head up over the wooden panels. Do you want to eat some ugly, smelly drone today? Torin asked. Whether Luna understood him or not, it was quite evident she was happy to be finally let out. Once the stall door was open, Luna thrummed happily and stretched out her wings, showing off in front of the rest of the jealous Hendricks. Do you want to go hunting? Torin asked in a deep, throaty growl. Nuna's bright green eyes lit up when she saw the reins and harness. She quickly lowered her head, and allowing him to slip it on. Meanwhile, Ben showed Milo how to secure the saddle properly. Stuff as many bolts as you can fit into the saddlebags. Then secure that blister good and tight. We'll be setting ducks without it and leave some room. You two tinheads are coming, too. Once that was finished, he pointed back toward the armory. Grab yourselves two crossbows and bring me a good sturdy spear. Then hop in the back, he commanded. Torn held the reins, keeping Luna calm as he guided her out the back way. They typically never went this way. For one, it was in the direction of Founder's Keep, and having dragons flying around the apprentice dormitories was quite frowned upon. And secondly, it was extremely narrow and required each rider to hop off their dragon and go in or out single file, which normally wasn't a problem unless one dragon was coming in and the other was being let out in which case, if it was two cantankerous bulldrags, things could go wrong fast. Thirdly, if such a traffic jam did happen, it turned out dragons, for whatever reason, hated going backwards. This was why everyone usually used the stone landing bridge that connected the dragon run with the two big doors, that two dragons could come in and out at once without causing any problems. But under this unique circumstance, where the lobby had been barricaded and all of Glendon was being set ablaze, there was no other choice. Once outside, Torn looked back as Ben and Milo came running with the things he had asked for. Are those loaded? Torn demanded. Ben and Milo both grinned and shook their heads. Obviously, they had defaulted to their safety training. Needless to say, Torn was not impressed. Why aren't they loaded? He shouted at the top of his lungs. The two recruits frantically bent down and set the strings 
and slid the arrow in place. Get on! No, not that way! Watch my tail! And don't shoot yourselves or my dragon! How many times have we gone over this in training? But we haven't, Milo exclaimed, torn Gafad. Ha! <laughs> Good! If we survive, you two can teach the others, he chuckled as he swung himself onto the saddle. Oof! Ben let out a grunt as he caught a boot to the helmet. Watch out! Friendly boot! Torn laughed. Luna let out a frazzled growl in protest as she was clearly not at all thrilled about being loaded up like a pack mule. Torin gave her an encouraging pat on the neck. That's all right. We aren't flying far. We'll be going in low and fast. Just a short glide into town. And we'll find you something nice to eat. All right, darling? He assured her, and then turned and snapped at the recruits impatiently. Where's my spear? he demanded. Milo awkwardly passed it over to Ben, and Ben relayed it over to Torn. Well, from here on out, since we might never talk again, I want both of you to know something important, Torin declared somberly. What? Milo asked. You're all ugly, Torin shouted. With a kick of his heels, he urged Luna forward. Despite being overburdened, Luna excitedly bounded forward. Her long claws tore into the earth as she raced toward the grassy ledge and leapt into the air. The mountain was steep, and they sped down toward the city like a comet. Torn cursed bitterly when he saw the burning buildings and wrecked navy ships below him. Just as he feared, the navy had been caught overextended, and they had been shattered like a fist going through the center of a long wooden board. Look out! Milo exclaimed. Torn urged Luna to bank hard to the left. The droon dragon rider pivoted back around. Suddenly, a great black silhouette eclipsed them. Get him off my tail, damn it! Torn cursed. Just when it seemed like they were about to be torn to pieces, Ben and Milo shot their crossbows. Torn turned his head and watched with grim satisfaction as the rider slumped over and fell out of his saddle, and the injured dragon recoiled in pain. I didn't mean to shoot the dragon, Milo gasped. Ha <laughs> ha! I suppose you two won a medal for that, huh? Torn chuckled. We can't reload again until we land, Ben warned. Roger that. I've found just the place, he declared. Torn guided Luna over to land on top of the stone triumphal arch that stood at the entrance to the city center. This monument normally was used for parades and important ceremonies, but for now it was the only structure flat enough, big enough, strong enough, and most important of all, it was not on fire for them to land on and set up their torsion ballista. Luna plopped herself down onto her belly as she panted out of breath from the heavy burden she had been carrying. Come on, come on, let's go, Torn hustled them. Once the ballista was set up and loaded, Torn took over. Don't just stand there gawking. Reload my crossbows, he instructed as he scanned the horizon. Well, it was hard to find where the dragons and the Droon fire bombers were at. It was pretty easy to figure out where they were going. All they had to do was find the rooftops that had not been caught on fire yet and... Gotcha, he growled. The powerful limbs sprung forward and sent the massive bolt right through the dragon's heart. Reload, Torn barked. What about the rider, Milo asked. <laughs> Gravity is a cruel mistress, my friend. He assured him and snatched Milo's loaded crossbow from his hands and scanned the sky. Ben rushed over to help Milo with the ballista. Sweat dripped down their faces as the middle gears clicked and clacked, as the braided rope sinews and wooden limbs creaked and groaned as they rearmed the heavy torsion weapon and set in a new barbed bolt. 
Good, get out of the way, Torn congratulated them as he handed them their now empty crossbows. Well, this isn't any fun, Milo grumbled as he planted his foot down on the metal foot stirrup and let out a grunt as he heaved back the string and rearmed the crossbow. If I die, you can take over. Keep reloading. There will be plenty more soon, Torrin assured him as he pulled the trigger and the ballista let out a very satisfying loud crack. Two down. There's another metal they can tack onto our coffins, he guffawed. Torn! Ben shouted, but it was too late. A drone dragon rider came swooping down. But before they were all crushed and ripped to pieces, Luna pounced on the rival dragon, and they both went snarling over the side of the tall monument. Torn rushed over to the ledge and watched helplessly. There was no calling her back, and even if she did come, it would only leave her exposed. She was a tough old Hendrake, but while she was making quick work of ripping out the rival dragon's throat, she left her head and neck unprotected from the Droon Rider and his axe. Torn roared as he leapt off the monument and tackled him to the ground. Ben and Milo watched in dismay. Torn had always sort of scared people, seeing him leap nearly forty feet to maul another human with his bare hands was an entirely different experience altogether. It didn't take long before the Droon infantry came swarming in to try and save their fallen rider. Luna swatted them away like flies with their tail. Seeing the approaching enemy archers, Torn tried to wave Luna away. Go! Oh, fly home, you overgrown lummox, he commanded, but the dragon would not leave. Luna howled wretchedly as the crossbow bolts pierced her wing and shoulder. Torn turned and hefted up the battle axe and ran at the archers. Their focus turned, and Torn's chest was pinned full of arrows, but even then he didn't stop. After he took the first man's head off, they fled away behind the advancing wave of heavily armored infantrymen marching in lockstep with their large black oval shields. Suddenly there was a searing hiss that came from on top of the triumphal arch as a heavy bolt from the ballista skewered the shield and two men behind it. But the gap in the line was quickly closed and the drone heavy infantry continued to march forward. But just as they were about to converge on Torn, Luna belched a river of liquid flame that sent the whole drone column sc- scattered and screaming in all directions. Before any of them could regroup, a loud horn sounded, followed by the sound of hooves and grim, metallic whirring of blades fixated on the wheels of Glendon chariots. Ben and Milo cheered as the chariots came charging in, reclaiming the streets and mowing down the invaders like grass as they fled toward their ships. Glendon was saved. We won, Milo guffawed. Ben grinned, but it wasn't long before he lost the sight of the fleeing droon soldiers, and his eyes settled on the men, women, and children lying in the street next to the burnt-out buildings. Torn, Milo gasped. Ben glanced down. He felt his legs go weak when he spotted Torn staggering about with dozens of crossbow bolts sticking out of him. Torn, don't worry, we're coming, Ben assured him. Torn grunted and gave a dismissive wave. Ah, I just banged up my knee. I done it when I jumped down, he assured them, as he limped back toward the white stone triumphal arch. But, but, you're shot, Milo exclaimed. Torn blinked and then glanced down. Yep, I'm going to need to buy another one, he agreed, and patted his brigadine harness and pulled out a broken arrow shaft. Hmm, that one got through, he grunted as he examined the bloody tip. Damn it, we need to get you to the menders, Ben insisted. Torn tossed the bloodied arrow away. It didn't even get an inch in. I paid good money for this harness. I told you, I'm a firm believer in second chances. 
Did I ever tell you about the time I got struck by lightning, he asked. How's Luna? Milo asked wordly. Ben glanced down, but to his surprise, Luna had pulled the arrows out and was now gently trying to nip at the bolts and torn. Well, we won't be flying back to Dragon Hall tonight. But she'll live to fight and fly another day, he assured them, as he struggled to push her large, shimmering bronze head away. How do we get down? Milo asked wordly. Carefully. If you fall and die, you'll make me look bad, Torrin advised. Milo grimaced. Well, I wouldn't want you to look bad, he grumbled, as he carefully felt out the best path down. Thankfully, the large carved images standing beneath the flat stone pillar provided the necessary hand and footholds. However, the moment they got safely down, a large burly man in a white feathered helmet and chest plate and singed white cloak trailing behind him called out, You two, quit standing around and join the fire brigade, he snapped, but Torn scowled and waved him away. Find your own damned help. These two belong to me, he growled. I am Dario Fox, the chief of Glendon Police. Every able bodied man that is not fighting is required to assist the fire brigade, he declared. Ben and Milo glanced over toward Torrin, curious as how he would respond. The Fox family name held a lot of influence in Glendon. These two ugly sinners are going to make sure my beautiful dragon doesn't eat any of your citizens or livestock, he announced. Dario gave one quick glance toward Luna, and his voice went up several octaves higher. Excellent. Carry on. I must be on my way, he agreed, and he hurried off. I'm glad we didn't bring hatters, Ben chuckled. Torn grinned a fierce toothy grin. We aren't out of this yet. You two walk a good ten paces ahead and see if you can't salvage a horse cart we can tow Luna back in. And don't let anyone come up close. The last thing I need is to explain to the overseer about some kid getting eaten, he instructed. Ben and Milo hurried to get out ahead until they eventually came across what they were looking for. A wooden, horse-drawn cart full of produce. I'll do fine! Toss the veggies! Torn called after them. Suddenly, a spry, thin old man came running out of the shop. Stop! Stop! Looters! Vandals! He shouted as he cracked his wooden cane over Milo's helmet. Ben quickly snatched the cane from the old man and stepped in before things got out of hand. We aren't thieves, we are. Um, his voice trailed off as he tried to think of a proper way to explain to someone they were taking their belongings without their mission for a perfectly good reason. But thankfully, he didn't have to explain their ethical theft, because fortunately, Torrin quickly stepped in to back him up. Back off, we're confiscating your cart, old man, Torrin snapped. But, but that's stealing, he protested. Come to Founders, make your grievances to the Overseer, and you'll get a hearing and well compensated later, Torrin grunted, and motioned for his two young assistants to continue tossing out the fruit and vegetables onto the street. Give me back my walking stick! I demand compensation now! the old man snapped angrily. Torrin rolled his eyes as he fished into his money pouch and pulled out a shiny gold coin and tossed it over. All right, now scram, he commanded. The old man's scowl melted his away as he caught the gold coin, but just as he held it up to the light, Luna let out an exciting fluting sound as she crooked her head and her large pupils dilated in onto the shiny object. Luna thrummed excitedly, her large talons rasped like side blades being dragged across the cobblestones. Damn it, Luna! Torrin exclaimed as he tugged at the reins, desperately trying to restrain her powerful swan-like neck. But thankfully, a bright green cabbage being tossed into the air quickly distracted her, and out of pure instinct, 
She turned and munched it down into mush before spitting it out with a disgruntled growl. Her bright green eyes glanced around, trying to find the crusty old man with the shiny coin, but he was nowhere to be seen, and she quickly lost interest. Quick thinking, Milo congratulated Ben. It's prey drive. That's why you never want to wave things around their face, he explained. Torn let out a frustrated sigh of relief. Great. You got any ideas on how to get her into the cart, he asked. Sure, you got a gold coin, Ben asked. Torn glowered at him. No worries, a shiny penny should work just as well, he chuckled as he fished out a tiny little copper coin and held it up to the light. Luna's head swiveled around, and Ben tossed it into the center of the wooden cart and quickly backed away as the dragon excitedly climbed in and protectively plopped herself down on top of it and flashed her teeth at him. I got to remember that trick, Milo remarked as he bit into a large orange carrot. Torrin nodded approvingly. Good. I'll wait here while you two steal some horses. Steal? Milo and Ben exclaimed. Torn rolled his eyes and discreetly handed over his leather money pouch. Steal, find, purchase, confiscate, whatever you gotta do. Just don't come back without them, he commanded. We won't let you down, Master Torn, Milo assured him. Torn nodded and turned his attentions back to his dragon. She was still curled up on the cart as she moodily guarded her newly acquired treasure. Luna's bright yellow eyes glanced over the wooden rails toward the injured warrior that leaned against the cart. I'll be all right. It's you I'm worried about, he assured her. Luna's large bronze head attempted to wedge her nostrils between the large man and the cart, but Torn raised his hand, threatening to wrap her on the nose if she continued to make a nuisance of herself. Luna responded with a loud blast of her nostrils, showering Torin with warm, sticky dragon mucus. Torin groaned and lifted his goggles. Maltine bless your little black heart as well, he grunted. But before he had a chance to see, a large, moist, sticky blue tongue went up his face and over the side of his head. Torn quickly backed away and put his hands up in protest. Luna, no, gods damn it, he cursed. Luna chortled happily, nuzzled her snout in, and as gently as a dragon could, clamped down on the arrow shaft protruding from his chest and quickly yanked it out. One out, five more to go. She quickly craned her head out of the cart and began nipping at the others. I said no, Torrin insisted as he firmly clasped his hands over her large snout, keeping her sh mouth shut like an alligator wrestler. While Luna's jaws could crush bones, she let out a frazzled, fluting sound as he squirmed about. She could not escape his firm grip. Once Luna settled down, Torrin stroked her and gently released. Luna gradually swiveled her head away and rested it next to her large back haunches and quietly sulked. You can lick your own wounds, Torrin gestured toward the bloody scales on her shoulder and injured wing. Luna let out a flustered, pent-up gust of air. Torrin shook his head and leaned back as he struggled to catch his breath. You're a spoiled snood, he remarked, as he impatiently looked away and grinned when he spotted Ben and Milo leading two large horses down the road. What's the butcher's bill? Torrin called. Milo's eyes went wide and he turned toward Ben. How much do they cost? Torrin clarified. We found them running loose, Ben grinned. Excellent. Give me back my money, and let's hook them up so we can get out of here, Torrin instructed. I said stay behind, Milo insisted. Torrin's grin faded. Stay? What for? he demanded. Everything's on fire. I don't feel right leaving the fight now, Milo insisted. Ben turned. To his surprise, he saw Milo's ashen face was streaked with tears. Not sobbing tears but angry tears. Tears of rage. He's seen the same tears when Brumir had gone running out to fight the dragon. 
Torn paused and set a mangled hand on top of Milo's shoulder and gave him a fierce, toothy grin. Listen to me, you ugly snot. We ain't running from nothing. Right now, we are just fighting in another direction. Got it? Milo bobbed his fuzzy head. We'll do nobody no good if we leave Luna running about here, hurt and scared, Torrin added as he hobbled over to the cart. Master Torrin, Ben gasped. Torrin didn't look down. He could feel his own warm blood running down his leg, where it squished between his toes inside his boot. Focus on getting Luna back. We only got a few dragons left, and plenty of good lads to take my place, he instructed. Milo and Ben quickly reached downward and helped Torrin clamber onto the wagon. Despite his injuries, Torrin sat up and grinned. I don't suppose none of you procured anything to drink, he inquired. Milo and Ben gave one another worried looks before glumly shaking their heads. Torin chuckled as he slowed the cart to a halt in front of the charred ruins of an inn. See if you can't find anything, he instructed. But, Ben exclaimed, Torn let out a guffaw. I ain't dying, fuzzbrains. Come on, let's be quick, I'm parched. He insisted. Ben and Milo hopped off and quickly emerged from the cellar, carrying two wooden crates. The glass bottles rattled as they hurried back to the cart. This feels so wrong, Milo groaned as he helped load the crates. Torn let out a deep, rumbling, low laugh that felt more dragon-like than human. I'll make good, proper soldiers out of here yet, he chuckled. He bit off the cork and leaned back, guzzling down the whole bottle in one gulp. Oh, what is this? he exclaimed. I thought everybody liked strawberry fizz, Ben remarked in surprise. Torn groaned and tossed the empty bottle out onto the road. Next time I'm putting Simmons in charge of looting, he scowled. There's grape fizz in this crate, Milo offered. Torn shook his head disappointedly. I'm surrounded by children, he groaned. It's the only thing that was left, Milo insisted. I suppose this is your first time looting, Torn grumbled. We aren't supposed to loot our own city, Ben protested. Ah, you've been hanging around Simmons too long, he scoffed. Do you prefer the word commandeering supplies for a good cause, he teased. Ben glanced worriedly over to the blood-soaked seat, but Torn's big smile was infectious, and he couldn't help but smile back despite their grim circumstances and the hellscape of burning buildings and sobbing citizens. But soon Ben felt the ache and guilt that Milo had when he requested to stay behind to help with the fires. His heart went out to every mother and grandparent and siblings, calling for their loved ones as they searched the wreckage. Ben hardened himself. He focused on the task at hand as much as he wanted to help. He remembered what Torn had said about Luna. Ben glanced over his shoulder. The cart creaked along, and Luna drowsily lay curled up in the back. Dragons could get rather drowsy after breathing fire. Dragons only breathe fire if they were threatened or wanting an ash bath to aid them while shedding and polishing their scales. Ben forced himself to focus on what would happen if they failed to bring Luna back. Some child or soldier poking around in the ash and mounds would find her. Luna would be startled. And then, after the horrible killing spree that would follow, she would have to be put down. Torn was right. As much as he wanted to help, it all would be for nothing if they didn't get Luna back to Dragon Hall safely. Uh, let me try a grape fizzy drink, Torn insisted. Milo chuckled as he reached down and passed over the grape fizz. What do you think, he asked. Simmons brought back worse, he grunted. Was it water? Milo teased with a nervous grin. Torrin shook his head. Fermented horse milk. 
Gross! I didn't even know horses gave milk, Milo exclaimed. From on top of the lookout tower, Cora breathed a sigh of relief when she spotted Luna curled up in the back of a horse-drawn cart. While there were mere specks in the distance, she could spot Luna from miles away. If Luna was alive, that meant Torn was too. If either one of them had been killed, she knew they would not have returned at all. As they came closer, Cora ran out to meet them. Torn, you look like my grandmother's pincushions, she exclaimed. But she, as she came closer, she spotted two very familiar helmets, and she hesitated for a split moment, and she quickly shook herself. Who? What makes you think you have the right to wear those, she demanded. Milo's grin faded, and his head drooped as he pulled the black-winged helmet from his head. Ben did the same, but Torin stepped forward. They can keep them, he insisted. Cora glared at him. Those don't belong to them, she seethed heatedly. Are you really going to cause trouble over Don's old sparring helmet and Nora's old things, he scowled. Nora isn't dead, Cora snapped. Yeah, well, she isn't coming back either, he grunted agitatedly. I don't want to cause any trouble, Ben insisted as he held Don's helmet out to Cora. Her fingers trembled briefly, and then she quickly snatched it away. Milo glumly handed his over as well. Cora quickly took them both in her arms, glowered at Torn, and then back at the two disheveled recruits, and then stormed away. You'll get better equipment later, Torn assured them. Milo and Ben stared at each other, and then back toward Torin. Does that mean? Milo asked. Yep, Torin grunted as he pulled out another broken arrow from his armor. Doesn't everyone have to vote first? Ben asked. Torin shrugged. Well, that's the easy part. I just have to figure out how many of our broken little family is still alive. And how many I have to kill, he chuckled as he limped along, guiding Luna over to her enclosure. She was so tired and eager to get back into her nest that she completely forgot about the copper coin that she had so fiercely been guarding a moment ago. Will she be all right? Ben asked worriedly. Torn nodded. Yeah, he's a Tough old Hendrake. Nothing vital was injured. She has full movement. Just a nasty flesh wound. She just needs some rest and some peace and quiet, he assured him. What about Majikora? Milo asked. Torin chuckled. She could use some rest too, I imagine, he remarked, and winced as he began unbuckling the brigandine harness and frowned as the thick padded black gambus and tunic underneath was soaked with blood. Ah, might have gotten a few more holes in me than I thought, he remarked. We should get you to Mender's, Ben insisted. Uh, I suppose I could get my knee mended too, Torin agreed. Chapter 22 Mender's Hall When Simmons landed, he was welcomed by Milo and Ben, and they quickly opened the gates for him. However, he was not able to stop and chat until he had gotten Prince inside and settled in. Once that was taken care of, he quickly greeted them again and began asking questions. I'm back! What did I miss? he asked. Milo's smile fell, and Ben's big shoulders drooped as he hung his head. Simmons grimaced. That bad, huh? He surmised by their sullen expressions. Where's everybody at? How's your friend Brumier doing? What's Torn up to? he asked. Master Torn and Irene are in Mender's Hall, and Brumier left, Milo sniffed. Simmons frowned. I'm sorry to hear that. Are they badly hurt? he asked wordly. Torn said he was fine. He was laughing all the way, and then we had to carry him when he fell. We weren't allowed in Mender's Hall. It's so crowded. We haven't heard anything yet since yesterday, 
Milo explained. Ben nodded in silent affirmation. The leather glove in Simmons' balled-up fist whined under the tension. Damn it! Nor was right. We should have killed that bulldrake when we had the chance, he cursed. Milo sighed. Yeah, things were going all right, but when they went wrong, we couldn't get at the dragon's vitals until we cleared out the ash we had laid down on the floor. And by that time, almost everybody up top was either killed or injured. Magi Solston died. We buried him a little while ago, along with everyone else. Simmons felt as if he was going to be sick. I'm so sorry I wasn't here. His torrent burnt up pretty bad, he asked worriedly. Oh no, Torn wasn't burned. We had to leave Founders to fight in Glendon. Torn was shot a bunch of times with arrows, Milo corrected him. Ben glumly bobbed his head up and down. Have you seen Master Warren? he asked weakly. Simmons closed his eyes. He remembered Nora begging him not to leave right away, to rest before flying back. But Warren, Warren should have beat him back by at least five to ten hours. He isn't back yet, is he? Ben shook his head. No. Simmons swallowed hard, and he stared up at the ceiling to keep his eyes from watering up. His voice quavered as he fearfully asked the next question. And Cora? he asked. Mender's Hall, Milo said, and then quickly added, But she isn't hurt. She's just checking up on everybody. Simmons let out a ragged sigh of relief. There was some good news, at least. But as he turned to go, Ben grabbed his arm. When you go see Torrin, could you check on May? Ben pleaded. Simmons quickly nodded. Yes, of course, I promise, he assured him. May's sapphire blue eyes fluttered open. She stared up at the ceiling, but the moment she recognized she was in the hospital in Mender's Hall, an icy wave of panic swept over her. Cora rose into view and gently took her hand in hers. Tears flooded down her face, but Cora spoke before she could manage to choke out the question. Irene is resting. Cora assured her. How are you feeling? she asked. May blinked, startled, and then paused. She wasn't really sure how she was. Slowly, she felt her fingers and then her toes, and then hesitantly she swallowed hard and gave a nod. Raven, she whispered, but she knew the answer. Cora shook her head. It wasn't your fault. There was nothing you could do, she assured her. May knew it was true, but it didn't help her feel any better. Tears ran down her face. She couldn't bear to go back. She didn't want to be a dragon rider anymore. She wondered what Ben would think of her. He would think she was just a quitter, but her mother would be happy. She couldn't bear the thought of her gloating. She wanted to weep, but the muffled sobs and groans down the hall reminded her how lucky she was. She reminded herself that she had no right to cry over a dragon she hadn't a chance to know. After all, she hadn't been killed or maimed. You have visitors, Cora informed her. Is it Ben? May asked hopefully. Cora pursed her lips into a thin frown of disapproval, but decided to spare the young woman a hard lecture about the rules that forbid recruits from dating or showing any signs of affection toward each other. Lady Sybil and your uncle are here to see you, she informed her. May struggled to sit up as she scrunched her face. Lady Sybil was the head overseer of all of Founders Keep. Only the apprentices about to receive a severe lashing or about to be expelled ever got to be sent up to see Lady Sybil. The only other time May had seen the overseer was at graduation, and only then from a distance. Who else is there? I'm not sure if I'm ready to see visitors yet, she squeaked. Cora hesitated and sat down on the bed beside her, 
and gave May's hand a comforting squeeze. But the haunted look in the elder woman's hazel eyes and grim lines on her face sent another wave of dread through her. It was the bone-chilling, sober look that said everything was going to be all right, even after something horrible had happened. There is no one else, child. Lady Sybil has come to give her support and condolences, Cora assured her. May might have been happy, but she felt the heaviness in Cora's voice. Before she could ask what she meant by this, Uncle Marley stood in the doorway with his large hat crumpled in his hands. His gray suit was rumpled, hair unkept, and his eyes were puffy and red. Lady Civil entered behind him. Even though she was half her uncle's size, she bore a grim and stern presence about her that towered over all in the room. The black flowing cape was normal. The head overseer was expected to wear black to show impartiality to the rest of the wings that compromised a founder's keep. However, the black pearl necklace, heavy eyeshadow, gloves, and gown were not typical, not unless something truly horrible had happened. May clutched the blanket closer to herself for a silly moment. She thought she might be in some kind of trouble. That was until Sybil gazed upon her with a weary, heartfelt, sympathetic smile. The sort of smile you gave someone at a funeral. The sad, happy to see you, wish I could make you laugh, even though your world has just ended. May tensed as Lady Sybil approached her, until finally she spoke in a stern, calm voice. Irene and Cora have told me so much about you. I'm very proud, she declared. Lady Civil was not known to give compliments. Quite the opposite. May knew whatever was going to be said next was going to be absolutely horrible. May felt a new wave of fresh tears run down her face. I don't understand. What's, what's going on? she asked. Cora took in a deep breath. Glendon has been attacked, she explained. May's eyes went wide. What? she gasped. She felt a lump form in her throat. What does that mean? she demanded and turned toward her Uncle Marley. Is my family all right? Are they hurt? she asked. Uncle Marley's face went bright red with grief, and he shook his head. I'm so sorry, May. They are dead, Cora said bluntly. May stared up at Cora, a long, sickening, sullen, empty moment of silence passed. If you wish to remain in Dragon Hall, you are welcome. But if you do not, I will understand. You will always be welcome back, Cora assured her. Lady Civil nodded. There will always be a place for you to serve and founders as well. I'm sure I can find something quiet and out of the way in the library. Perhaps even a teaching position in the communications wing when you're up for it. But you do not need to decide now, she added. And then, with a small bow, she turned and left. The moment Civil was gone, Uncle Marley rushed over and May embraced him and began to sob in his arms. Cora turned away and briskly walked out the door. There was a lot more that needed to be done. So many injured, so many dead, and so many recruits were leaving. It was then she spotted a familiar face. Damn it, Brumir! You weren't at roll call this morning, she snapped at him. I've come to say goodbye. I'm leaving Dragon Hall, Brumir declared. Cora wanted to punch him. So you're quitting too, she scowled angrily. But Brumir straightened up and looked right in her eyes. I've joined the infantry and I'm going to fight the drone, he declared. Cora was a bit taken back. Brumir had always been so quiet and soft-spoken, but now there was a stoic serenity about him, 
She still remembered that haunted, determined look on his face as he walked out from the cover with a crossbow in hand. Premier had helped her keep everything together, helped to evacuate the wounded, and now the fat bastard was leaving when Dragon Hall needed him the most. I see, you even have a sword too, she remarked, but her soft tone turned hard. If you want my advice, I think you're making a big mistake, she snapped at him. Nevertheless, it has been made, Brumir declared. Very well. Have you told Master Irene already? Cora inquired. Brumir stoically held out a piece of parchment. Could you give this to her? he asked. Cora glanced down at the letter in his hand. Why don't you give it to her yourself? she demanded. The young man's chest deflated, and he shuffled his feet nervously. Magi Nims won't let me see her, Brumir sighed. Cora folded her arms and glanced down reproachfully at the letter. Do you always do what you're told, Brumir? She scowled and then turned away. Magi, please, he begged. Cora spun around. She was red and shaking with rage. You shot a dragon in the face with a crossbow and lived. Be a man and give the stupid letter yourself. I don't have time for you, she snapped at him. Without another word, Cora marched out, but as she passed through the garden, she spotted Simmons. Simmons embraced her tightly. I'm so sorry. This is all my fault. I should have listened. I'm sorry I left, he gasped. Cora wanted to be upset, but she felt his shoulders quake as he began to weep, and she began to sob as well. Don't be an idiot. If you had stayed, I might have had to bear you as well, she gasped. Simmons swallowed hard. What? What happened? he asked, and took a step back, giving Cora space to breathe and time to respond. We were attacked. There was nothing we could have done. The dragon was being controlled by a necromancer. Glendon got hit hard by air and by sea. But it was only a diversion. The main attack was down south, she explained. What about Torn? he asked. Cora smiled. Torn is fine. He'll be fine. He is sleeping. He needs some rest. He has lost a lot of blood, is all. But he's had a lot worse, she assured him. Simmons let out a grateful, ragged sigh. How about May and Irene? How bad are they? he asked. May has been through a lot. Now is not a good time. But physically, she is well and in one piece. As for Irene, she has used quite a bit of energy. Such a spell might have outright killed even a skilled mage. She is a lot tougher than she looks, she assured him. Irene squinted as she heard a soft knock on the door. Before she had a chance to tell whoever it was to go away, the door opened and in walked a young soldier in a bright green new uniform and a sword on his belt. She raised a dark, disapproving eyebrow. What in the world are you wearing, Brumir? she demanded coldly. Brumir attempted to stand a little straighter. I just wanted to say goodbye before I left, he informed her. Irene's sharp jade green eyes locked in on the familiar wooden box in his hand. She had found that box tucked away into the rocks. So, you are the one who drew all those pictures, she remarked. Brumir offered a sheepish grin and pulled a small charcoal likeness of her playing her harp inside the cleft of the rocks while gazing out toward the sunset and her secret place. Have you been spying on me? She remarked dryly. I really hope you aren't about to say something stupid, she warned. Brimir quickly shook his head. No, 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 nothing like that. I was 
Well, I wasn't allowed to talk to you while I was a recruit, and well, I just, I was just here to say goodbye, is all. I'm leaving Founders, he explained, and then puffed out his chest. I've joined the army, he declared proudly. Irene closed her eyes. Her head was aching. I'm sorry for disturbing you, Bromir apologized, but the moment he turned to leave, he found the door had locked itself. He tried to push the latch, but it wouldn't budge. Did I say you were dismissed, recruit? Irene snapped at him. Brumir grit his teeth and turned. I am Private Brumir Suntully, and I'm not a recruit anymore. I have joined the army, and I'm leaving Glendon to fight the Droon, he declared. Irene didn't open her eyes. Her thin nostrils flared as she took in a deep breath. Private Brumir Suntully? As Dragon Master, I command you, shut up and sit down, she ordered. You can't, Brumir began, but then he hesitated. Actually, she could tell him to stand on his head if she wished. But, he protested, then stand if you wish. But as Magi and Dragon Master, I have the power to requisition and indefinitely... Confiscate any military personnel, assets, or resources to assist me in my work. If you had merely left as a civilian, things might have been different, but now things are very different. Do you understand, Private Sundully? Irene responded in a cool, quiet, but very stern whisper. Brumir gulped. You aren't feeling well. I should call Nims, he began. Nims would skin you alive as she caught you in here, and then she would drag you off by your ear to your commanding officer and have you publicly flogged, Irene reminded him. Brumir bit his lower lip and tugged at his collar. Once she was certain that Brumir was paying attention, Irene went on. So, you are a recruit, is that correct, Private Brumir Santali? I took an oath and enlisted this morning, he declared, but Irene didn't so much as look at him. Brumir felt a chill run down his spine as a thin, devious smile flared across her serenely pale face. And you want to go run off? To fight the Droon, do you? she inquired. Brumir grimaced. He didn't like the condescending tone in her voice. Instead of responding, he turned to leave, but the door handle was stuck. So do I, Irene informed him. Brumir turned. His eyes went big when he saw Irene standing in her white nightgown, her dark hourglass silhouette illuminated by the soft candlelight behind her. I really should go. I need to report back this evening, Brumir insisted. You will not join. I forbid it, Irene declared. But I already did. I took an oath, Brumir protested. But before he could speak another word, Irene captured his lips in a long, passionate kiss. You will be... My sword companion, she whispered. Boomer gasped as she pressed up against him. But I need to learn how to fight first. I, he began. His sword clattered onto the floor. Irene grinned, her jade green eyes alight with fierce desire and vengeful passion. I don't want a boy with a pointy stick. I need you. You will fly with me. You will map out the enemy locations. Together we will bring the Droon's plans to ruin, she vowed feverishly. Can I at least think about it first? Brumir panted. Irene grinned a wicked grin, and she bit his lower lip, and one by one broke away the shiny brass buttons from his long overcoat. 
You're all mine now, she purred. My name is Marco, and I am the author, narrator, and glee man for Founders Keep. Uh, I wrote this during the lockdowns, and it is an audiobook for free on my YouTube channel at Dragon Audiobooks. If you want to read along, and if you absolutely love the book, uh, you can get the hard copy, and you can get it in digital cool thing about this book is that you can share it with your friends and um, you know you know J.R. Tolkien would you like to write him you can't he's gone J.K. Rowling you probably could messenger she's a busy lady she might get back to you but me I am here to entertain you I am not just a writer I am a glee man if you will and I do podcasts. I do audiobooks. So not only will you get this audiobook, you'll get all the other stuff that I put out on, on YouTube. And, um, and the most important thing. A sword. And the most important thing. There will be dragons. There will be lots of dragons. And most fantasy books, dragons have gone extinct in their gone these dragons are very much here and real so there will be dragons um uh, fancy so founders keeps fancy fiction uh magic mages swords true love revenge dragon audiobooks uh follow me on twitter dragon audiobooks youtube